Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you for being here today for our uh, event. Uh, my name is Elidor Mahili. I teach European and uh, Cold War history, uh, including the history of Southeastern Europe and the Balkans. Um, and this semester, I've been teaching a course uh, on Eastern Europe's Cold War, uh, where we have featured a number of uh, Albanian uh, writers as part of the syllabus. And so we're very lucky and very grateful today to speak to one of them. Uh, and uh, the, the here at the Harriman Institute, uh, I know that we have a very interesting turnout and we have folks joining us from various parts of the world and various academic institutions. And we're also looking very much forward to uh, hearing what you have to say and, and, and your, your contributions to our session today as well. Uh, the Harriman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions for, study, uh, for the study of Russia, uh, Eurasia and East Central Europe. Uh, it supports research, instruction, and, and, and teaching, uh, as well as it organizes multidisciplinary events that bring together faculty, students, and alumni uh, from around the world. Uh, I'd, I'd encourage you, in addition to our event today, to check out the website for a list of many, many other interesting events, some of them in person, some of them in, in online, uh, and especially uh, uh, one of the latest initiatives, a podcast series called Voices of Ukraine, very powerful uh, initiative that that brings experiences and voices from from um, from the, the the current war. Uh, our guest today uh, uh, is Lura Limani, uh, who is approaching a, a, a historical period from a, a, a very personal uh, perspective. Uh, there, uh, related to this, related to our event today, uh, was an essay that I've just shared. Uh, in the box with you all that was published, uh, I believe it was in December uh, uh, of, of last year, so fairly recent essay in Kosovo 2.0, uh, My Grandmother, Yugonostalgia, and An Unfinished Tale. And I, I remember reading that essay, I was in Albania at the time, and I, I immediately, I, I, I knew that I wanted to talk to Dura at some point about the essay uh, in some sort of setting, so I'm very, very glad that we have that opportunity to do so today and to do it with you all as well in attendance. So a few words about her. Uh, Lura Limani is a writer, a researcher based in Pristina, uh, Kosovo. Uh, she's one of the founders of the independent literary design and publishing house, uh, Liri India, uh, and the former editor-in-chief of Pristina Insight. Uh, she has published fiction, essays, and journalistic work in a number of platforms, Beton, Balkan Insight, uh, Osservatorio Balkani Caucaso, Kosovo 2.0, Fabrik Zeitung and other publications as well. She's co-author of Boom in 2020, a publication which chronicled uh, Kosovo's pop and rock scene in the 1980s, uh, and currently works as a program director at the Kosovo Foundation for Open Society. So thank you for uh, uh, sharing uh, your thoughts with us today and your process, Lura. Uh, in a way, this is a bit of a return for you to Colombia because you were visiting fellow here a few years ago, and I remember us, us talking at the time. Uh, before I hand out the floor to our to our guest speaker, uh, just a reminder that uh, towards the end of our session today, we're very much look forward to your, to your questions and engagements. So feel free to use the Q&A box uh, right down uh, underneath at the bottom of the panel. Uh, and we will get to those towards the towards the second half of our of our session today. So, without further ado, uh, Lura, I, I hand it out to you. Thank you, Elidor. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here, actually, and taking time off your very busy schedules. I'm uh, very happy to join you, even though only virtually. And I want to thank the Harriman Institute for offering us this platform, and particularly you, Elidor for being so gracious and to invite me to discuss this essay that, as you mentioned, I recently wrote for Kosovo 2.0. And it's actually kind of interesting because I've kind of I've talked about my research, but never really about kind of something as um, sort of essayistic and literary as this. So it's going to be a process for me as well to kind of explain and reflect a bit on how that essay came about and what I kind of also myself learned from it. And so what I would like to talk today with um, uh, with you and as well as hopefully we will get into a discussion with the participants as well later on is a bit about that essentially a bit what can you know what uh, can personal histories and kind of the way the memories are uh, stored and chronicled and also retold help us understand about history and I personally focus on a very specific period which is the second world war and the immediate aftermath 
And I did so through the story of my grandmother, who was a teacher um, and a political activist in socialist Yugoslavia. But what a political activist meant in Yugoslavia is, you know, up for debate, really, because most people who worked in the public sector was all, were also party members. So it's not a question of, you know, um, of activism the way that we understand it today, perhaps. Um, and yeah, I will also talk a bit about the context as well, because uh, preparing for this uh, talk today, I realized that a lot of the context is kind of uh, washed away from the essay itself, which I hope some of you have read, and hopefully some of you will read after this talk if I am convincing enough that it's interesting enough. Um, and yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a position that I'm really aware that there has been so much scholarship and books and um, documentaries and articles written about uh, the socialist period in Yugoslavia and particularly about uh, the violent uh, breakup of Yugoslavia. And so it's to me, I do understand that this to some people might seem like an exhausted topic, perhaps. Um, on the other hand, for us who are dealing with the aftermath of the of the violent wars, I think there is kind of an irresistible pull to this topic. Um, and this is perhaps also why I personally kind of uh, go like kind of go over, like go to it over and over again. But before I mean, like I start, I took an advice from a friend of mine who is a historian and she told me, please bring a map. So I'm gonna share my screen so everyone knows where we are at geographically um, and, you know, just to, to situate every uh, one. So I'm, as I did explain, I'm based in Kosovo, as and you can see in this map, Kosovo is a landlocked country in southeastern Europe, and it, was, it used to be until, um, until very recently, one would say until 1999, part of uh, kind of this, uh, well, it was uh, between 1945 and 1990 was part of Yugoslavia and then we can discuss what happened in the 90s and whether we can consider that still Yugoslavia and as you can see uh, the administrative borders here uh, basically that Kosovo to this day maintains and since 2008 since it's declared its independence um, are basically kind of uh, inherited from the socialist period during which Kosovo was an autonomous province as part of Yugoslavia so the context today is that uh, while most Western countries recognize Kosovo's independence, um, Serbia does not, and so uh, also five members of the European Union do not, which means that Kosovo is one of those states that in the IR they would learn as contested states, but nevertheless, uh, it's important to know this because this is also the reason why when we talk about dealing with the past, it's not a question of this kind of a conclusive historical period that is you know, really definite and everyone is on the same page about, okay? Um, so this is another map that kind of shows you how uh, this part of the Balkans looked like between 1945 and 1990. So as you can see here, this is the map of Yugoslavia and you can see the six constituent republics, namely Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia and Macedonia, today North Macedonia and also in Montenegro, sorry. Um, and you can also see within Serbia, two autonomous provinces, Kosovo and Vojvodina, which throughout the socialist period had different kind of um, self-governing uh, rights. And particularly after 1974, uh, they, had, they basically had very similar rights to the other constituent republics, including direct representation in the presidency of Yugoslavia and other federal institutions like the federal constitutional court, et cetera. So uh, to some degree, um, the, the, what it meant for Kosovo and Vojvodina to be autonomous changed through time. And obviously uh, with the beginning of the fall of Yugoslavia, which is in the 90s in 1990, uh, we see a revocation of autonomy and a centralization of, uh, of powers once more, which is also uh, inevitably then leads to a series of wars. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get into the reasons why there were wars, but basically this is kind of how the map looked like before the 1990s war, which began with uh, the 10 day war with Slovenia and then Croatia, Bosnia, and finally Kosovo in 1998, 1999. Now, some of the basic facts about Yugoslavia, which might be superfluous to some, especially since you're near nearing the end of your semester. And I know that you've talked a bit about this. Yugoslavia, uh, despite being a communist country, was not part of the Eastern Bloc and actually was one of the founders of the non-aligned movement. And the non-aligned movement was established in 1961 in Belgrade. So we're talking here about a country that kind of paved the third way 
between the, the first world, the West, and then uh, the Eastern Bloc. Um, what this meant is, and well, this happened actually because of the 1948 split between Tito and Stalin, uh, which in itself is a saga of, you know, of, um, it's a power struggle, more or less. Um, but basically what this meant is that uh, Yugoslavia was left after 1948 outside of the sphere of influence, of the Soviet sphere of influence, and basically, as you can see, was technically kind of isolated from its neighboring countries that were communist and pro-Soviet. And this includes Albania, uh, and uh, maybe it's worth mentioning for some of you that the majority of the population in Kosovo is was and is Albanian. And basically the borders was a hard border that kind of cut this population of the same ethnicity, well, more than in half, essentially, because Albania was bigger. But um, so what we see, why it's important to perhaps mention this is exactly because um, what this meant, uh, the fact that uh, Yugoslavia was basically uh, isolated from the Soviet bloc, um, it meant that it kind of led to it being more open to the West and it led to be, it being more open for loans from the West as well as grants. And uh, what eventually resulted in a type of, uh, in a type of development that was basically uh, different from other countries. In terms of culture, this also meant that Yugoslavia was more culturally lenient, but despite all of this, I do not want to create this idea that Yugoslavia was a democracy because it definitely was not and actually was very severe in the persecution of political dissidents, um, and particularly so before 1966. Now, as a researcher and writer, so this is just kind of the context, uh, the context for where I'm writing from, really. Um, as a researcher and writer, I keep going back to this, the topic of the social and cultural history of Yugoslavia, because to me, it's fascinating on two levels. First of all, Albanians, like the social cultural history of Albanians in Yugoslavia is not very um, it's not very studied, and so it's obviously it's a very good opportunity for original research. But on the other hand, I'm also attracted to look into this period because Albanian experience is usually kind of um, either excluded or added as an afterthought in knowledge that is produced about Yugoslavia. And uh, now this is also on a pragmatic level, obviously, because Albanians are excluded not only because even during the socialist period they were not treated or like they were not seen as equal to the other nations, but also just in terms of kind of ethnicity and uh, linguistics, right? Uh, Albanians were linguistically and ethnically different from the Southern Slavs. So they're really not kind of considered as part of the history of Yugoslavia. And now um, I'll give a concrete example because Edizar mentioned that uh, two years ago, uh, I worked together with my friend and colleague Rina Krasnice on this uh, publication called Boom. And we were looking into this very, you know, um, undocumented and basically, I don't know, unknown in a way, rock and pop festival that was organized in Kosovo in the 1980s. It was a multi-ethnic festival that was being organized just as like political tensions were actually increasing. And what we discovered is that during the research that we did, that not like not even a single band from Kosovo is included in the Yugoslav Encyclopedia of Rock. Not that there weren't bands, and so not even local Serb bands, let alone Albanian bands. The only bands or Albanians that were present in this kind of history are people like Zona Nimani, who was the front woman of the band Zona, which was a kind of this super Yugoslav band. And obviously she sang in Serbo Croatian. So this is just an example, but it can like it can indicate how even when people write this joint history of Yugoslavia, uh, and this is very rare because of the kind of the nationalist uh, discourse that uh, well, the nationalist path that each country then resumed after the collapse of Yugoslavia and each kind of post-socialist republic developed this these narratives that are based on nationalist uh, stories. And they have to, like, even politicians who were, let's say, active in the in during Yugoslavia have to renounce that Yugoslav past. So, like, the joint history is not really being written by anyone that much. But even when it is, it's basically we see this kind of lack of Albanians in that history. And now this tension is also obviously not just one sided, it's also from the Albanian side as well, because most Albanians would consider um, Kosovo subsumption into Yugoslavia after the Second World War as an occupation uh, and do not see themselves as part of this, you know, haven't they have been like, a, they don't see themselves as a willing party to this history making of Yugoslavia, right? Uh, or as agents. So this is also poses a question whether Kosovo Albanians 
or like the history of Kosovo and Kosovo Albanians should even be written as part of Yugoslav history, you know, to begin with. Like, so these are kind of the unresolved and ongoing discussions that are going all in the background and might help to explain why when I was actually approached uh, from Kosovo 2.0 to write a different as well piece um, on the leftist uh, legacy of Yugoslavia, uh, a topic that I think really most people would find probably tedious, uh, you know, this presented the writer with kind of a minefield, uh, potential minefield. And I obviously, I'm quite young. I was born in 1988. And um, this is just when, you know, kind of Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian leader, is coming to power. Um, so by the time that I was old enough to create any meaningful memories, uh, Kosovo Albanians lived in sort of an, uh, in a segregated society that was like a um, apartheid kind of constellation where we went to school separately from, from our Serbian peers. And we also, uh, we had our diplomas issued from the parallel institutions unrecognized by the Serbian state. Uh, from the Kosovo Republic. So I don't really have a sense or like a firsthand experience of Yugoslavia, but it's not that I came to this topic um, completely ignorant because uh, a few years prior to that, I was involved in the Kosovo Oral History Initiative, which is a local project that was founded by Dr. Ana Dilelio. And um, it was basically, it was started as a project to really collect these stories of Kosovars from all walks of life. And one of the things that we were doing in 2015 um, is that uh, together with Anna, we were working on this kind of project to map out these conflicting memories of the Second World War in Kosovo. And uh, actually, it's really funny because like we, uh, this was years ago now, but yeah, we also presented a piece of that research at the annual conference of the Institute for the Study of Human Rights here at Columbia. Uh, and yeah, and another thing that we actually did as part of this project was this was an exhibition for the commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Second World War. And it was the only, I think, the only the only kind of event to celebrate that in Pristina and Kosovo, which is kind of funny because uh, the anniversary is on May 9th, the Victory Day, which was adopted by the European Union as like Europe Day. And we in Kosovo even celebrated as a national holiday, but kind of divorced from its World War II uh, background entirely. So during this research project that was led by uh, Anna, I think that even then we were really aware that there were conflicting narratives in Kosovo, not just about kind of this legacy of socialism, but also before that about the Second World War. And particularly this is true because, um, and this is, I mean, I guess it's very difficult to kind of say this now because of the whole uh, kind of the Nazi discourse coming back with Ukraine, but um, the axis of occupation of Yugoslavia uh, of Yugoslav territories was not necessarily perceived negatively by the Albanian population because first of all, parts of Kosovo were for the first time joined to Albania proper and uh, were subsumed under the Italian control. And uh, so the, the local Albanian population perceived this as, um, as a unification. And then also it helped that the fascist Italians recognized a lot of fundamental rights that the Yugoslav kingdom uh, which was being, uh, well, yeah, so this is the first Yugoslavia, to any Yugoslavias, um, did not recognize fundamental rights like uh, education in Albanian language and also uh, use, the use of Albanian in, a, in administration, which the fascists did. So, for example, I'll show you here a picture. Oh, okay. I forgot to mention Josip Broz Tito because he was the head of Yugoslavia, but I'm sure we'll get back to him. Uh, I wanted to show you this map of Albania uh, during the um, during the Axis occupation, because as you can see, uh, it expanded into covering and controlling parts of Co a lot of parts of Kosovo, and this is why for a lot of Albanians, this the Axis occupation was preferable to the Yugoslav Kingdom. And uh, another photo that actually this is from our research with the Kosovo Oral History Initiative, and this picture is basically in, in the center of the picture, you can see here the mayor of the town Jakova, where my grandmother comes from. Um, and this is 19, either 1941 or 1942. And there, uh, the mayor is walking in a procession with the Italian officials and as well as the, cler the religious clergy to celebrate the Flag Day, the National Albanian Day, which again, um, before the Albanian flag was also not allowed to be used. So you, you can see that there was, so for Albanians, these are the things that 
meant um, progress during the occupation. So now after the war ended, the communists were both in control in uh, Albania proper and in Kosovo, but Kosovo remained under Yugoslavia. And so this memory of the benevolent fascist completely was excluded from the official narrative. And in fact, on both sides, uh, the invaders were called quislings, like people who collaborate with the invaders were called quislings and were persecuted. And particularly um, Albanian national activists uh, who had joined forces with the either Germans or the Italians to either, you know, remove the Serbian yoke or um, join the Albanian territories under one state were either imprisoned or executed. And this happened on both sides of the border. And in Yugoslavia, um, first the state um, state security department, OSNA, and then later on UDBA, which was the state security services, retaliated. They went after the nationalist Croats, Ustashas, the nationalist Serbs, Chetniks, and then the nationalist Albanians, Balis. But then after that, and especially after the 1948 uh, Soviet-Yugoslav split, because Albania was pro-Soviet, they also just persecuted Albanians in general because... Um, they were targeted, not everyone was persecuted, but they were targeted because as Albanians, they were assumed to be uh, collaborators, collaborators of pro-Soviet Albania. So this was another added element to this kind of paranoia. Uh, oh, sorry, well, oh, okay, moving too fast. Um, now, basically this persecution of Albanians is a lot why the socialist period is remembered Sorry, I'm trying to check my time so I don't go over. Um, it's this persecution during the socialist period is also why the memory of Yugoslavia is what Stefanie Schwan the Sievers, uh, quoting Ricoeur, calls a wounded memory. You know, despite that during this period we have we you see this uh, progress and you have like an ushered from a feudal like you have Kosovo ushered from a feudal society into a modern society with an industrial economy. Uh, the Yugoslav legacy is simply not just that of progress, but really of repression, discrimination, and especially for Albanians who, for example, Albanian language still, until 1971, was not recognized as an official language in Yugoslavia, and this is also the year when you, we had the first university in Albanian opened uh, that was educating in Albanian, and these things did not occur in vacuum, obviously they occurred because of massive protests that happened in 1968. And it's only like during this period between 1971 and particularly after 1974 until 1981 when Tito dies, that you have kind of this golden period and which is kind of recognized by uh, Kosovo Albanians as well, that Kosovo uh, experienced both this kind of extended autonomy and development. Now, despite this, even this golden period ended quite quickly. And so we have like 10 years, maybe that we can say it was a golden period. And then in the eighties, again, we have um, a lot of political um, tensions, particularly massive protests in 1981, demanding for uh, Kosovo to be a Republic. So to be equal to other Republics. And this is followed by obviously persecution of political activists who are either detained illegally, arrested, tortured, um, and some even killed. And now figures vary about this and it's very, I'm gonna use them, although I'm very kind of prone to not using those figures because I know Howard Clark uses, basically says that up to half a million of Albanians at some point or another were detained by the authorities. And so this situation in the 80s gets progressively worse until 1989 when Kosovo's autonomy gets revoked entirely. And basically Kosovo is in, um, Kosovo gets, well, the Serbia declares a state of emergency in Kosovo. And then um, the 90s obviously are a period of severe repression where Albanians are kicked out of their jobs, all public institutions, public facilities, including hospitals, and they develop a parallel system of governance, which is not recognized by the Serbian state. This all culminates with the 1998-1999 war, where uh, about 13,000 people were either killed or disappeared. This and almost a million people were deported or basically expelled from their homes and the country. Now I got like a very fast uh, kind of historical um, context because I think all of these things play into how we approach the socialist period at all because the war is very fresh and you know um, none of the crimes that happened in the war are either recognized by Serbia or in any sense uh, there has been no closure in that uh, 
case. So when we write about Yugoslavia, it's really that we're con like we have to contend with all of this context. And this is perhaps why um, you know, dealing with the past in Kosovo context is not straightforward at all because we're dealing with multiple things. We're dealing with the aftermath of the war, which is quite recent, so 20 years. And then uh, also we're dealing with the communist past, communist repression. And then that is also not just simply ideological because it is tied to, um, it's tied to this oppression based on ethnicity and national identity. So it's a bit of a complex um, jumble. And uh, so, back to the article. <laughs> the original idea when I was approached was really to write a very straightforward piece about, and I wanted to interview people who had experienced Yugoslavia, um, who had lived through it, who had either remembered it or like were basically, um, who kind of remembered all the things about it, the good, the bad, the very ugly. And I wanted to interview, first of all, people who are very much involved in maintaining this legacy. So there is an organization of veterans of the National Liberation, Anti-Fascist National Liberation War, as the, as the Second World War is uh, referred to in Yugoslavia. And they are a small group of people, um, most of whom are basically family members or relatives of former veterans, because most veterans have passed away. And they are volunteers and may basically uh, kind of have this mission of educating people about the war and also about they try to uh, preserve the monuments of from the socialist period, most of which have been desecrated or you know destroyed since the Kosovo War. And essentially, it's a very small time organization made up of volunteers. And I also wanted to interview other people who had either worked in the system, who were in the you know administrators. Um, officials, uh, teachers, people who basically lived and worked in this uh, Yugoslavia, but not necessarily kind of had a stake in shaping what it was. And finally, I also really wanted to interview people who were most affected by it. So the political prisoners who kind of survived the system. And they are also, they also have a, an organization through which they also publish books and educative materials because they also want to, uh, and they also advocate for the rights of former prisoners. So there is sort of there are interest groups or stakeholders as we call them in the in the project lingo that um, have a stake in this uh, discussion. But from the moment that I started to do the research, I realized that the approach was kind of problematic because I started with my, the interviews with the veteran organizations and like my family name kind of really determined the outcome of these interviews. Like it opened doors, but it also kind of closed avenues of inquiry. Like um, first like at the Veterans Association for, for the, um, of the anti-fascist war, I introduced myself as the granddaughter of Mirveta Hoja um, and the, the, who was the sister of Fadil Hoja. Now, like a bit of an explanation who Fadil was. So Fadil Hoja was basically uh, one of the founders of the communist resistance against the Axis forces in Kosovo proper. Uh, he was a partisan commander, he was a teacher, and later on he became a Yugoslav politician, so he had held multiple functions um, during his uh, career, but most notably he was, so the highest function he ever had, he was the vice president of the presidency of Yugoslavia, which I will, um, so basically at some point Yugoslavia had a president for life, which was Tito, but it also had like a rotating presidency, um, that included all the republics and, and then later all the autonomous provinces. Now, uh, Hadid had been like, so he was, uh, so he's a very big figure of that period, but essentially he's not necessarily, uh, you know, not, he's not necessarily beloved because he, while he is credited as a statesman to some of the development that Kosovo experienced, especially in the seventies, his legacy is also contentious because he was enmeshed in a system that actually persecuted and repressed Albanians, especially national uh, nationalist ambitions. So like for sure, um, he is, uh, I would say a contentious figure. And for example, for the last 10 years, the Veterans Association has been trying to erect a statue in his honor since his death, but that's been impossible because of resistance in the local communities who do not see him necessarily as a figure that must be commemorated, right? Um, so from the first interview that I had with uh, the veterans, uh, well, the veteran relatives really, I became aware and somewhat kind of alarmed because the interviewees were perceiving my curiosity in this um, in this period as a type of, you know, as a type of like, 
quest to save the family honor and to save these historical figures from either like cruel oblivion or you know being reframed as traitors and um it wasn't that i was not interested in like prodding the family history but uh I mean, stories of great men who have sacrificed for the nation was not really something that kind of was my initial, um, was not something that interested me in general. And this is maybe perhaps with my kind of this oral history background as well, but uh, I'm kind of more interested in unearthing these stories that history usually overlooks rather than kind of upholding anything like that. And I also realized then because of my family history, and this is also because we live in a small country and everyone knows each other sort of, I was probably not the best person to write like an objective article about this without some self-reflection. Um, I mean, it, the family history posed an inherent bias perhaps, and I needed to confront that. And this is, was not, I didn't want to confront this as a type of performative self-flagellation, you know, and try to kind of admonish myself from the legacy, but really I wanted to kind of uh, inquire into this link that basically also tied my own interest to this period. And so, I mean, I obviously am not a historian, and so when I told my sister, who my sister who is a historian, that I wanted to write this from a personal perspective, she just told me that um, you know she discouraged me and told me that I should get ready for the pitchforks to come out. But I did it because um, you know I was really like I had this really had this image in my head, and it starts the essay too. If you read it, it starts with an image, um, and this image is this actually it's my grandmother's my late grandmother's hair salon so um it still operates it's uh it's really you know it's basically it's a remnant of yugoslav times it's in the middle of pristina um and it's it's hilariously titled armaria which means future but it's it's really a blast from the socialist past when you know uh enterprises were either called progress or dawn and future as this one and I really love it because like only the ads have changed, but nothing inside the interior has changed. And so I, I run, I, well, I live very close to here and uh, I walk past it multiple times every day. And I really like kind of had this image in my, in my mind about my grandmother as a creature of habit, who despite everything that happened and her disillusionment in the original socialist Yugoslav promise, would like always went to the same hair salon and because of the familiarity. So there is something kind of deeply, um, I wanted to kind of investigate that deep uh, connection that she had also with her Yugoslav sense of identity and Yugoslav self. So, and my grandmother also died five years ago. And so it was also for me like a personal journey of the way to mourn her. And also a process that made me think about how we remember people and how we preserve their memories and how, you know, death glosses over complexities that people have and how we kind of think of people as very simplistic after they die. And I mean, to be able to say something very meaningful and honest about Yugoslav legacy, I had to inspect my position as a writer and obviously tied inevitably to the, that of my grandmother who had no choice, but had been Padir Hoja's little sister for all her life. And as I have, been and I continue to be her granddaughter. So what this meant in practical terms, you know, was I doomed to look at Yugoslavia with these rose tinted glasses? I don't think so. But I also had to dig deeper into my own grandmother's stories, the stories she told um, to illustrate not only her as a person, but maybe like this life, this context that she built um, and to build, a, to draw like this bigger picture of the Yugoslav period. And also it was kind of uh, interesting because in terms of material, I had quite a lot. Um, I was raised by my grandmother to some extent. I lived with her all my most of my life. Uh, I was very close to her. Although if you read the essay, you can see that there was, uh, this relationship was definitely complicated and particularly because she was a very difficult person, especially after her youngest son and later on her husband died. So for ex luckily I had interviewed my grandmother in 2015 um, sorry, 2014, uh, a year before she died, as part of the Oral History Initiative, and together with my colleagues Yeta Reja and Katina Krasniche, and this is an interview that's uh, fully open access, it's on our website, uh, oral history, Kosovo, I think, oralhistorykosovo.org, um, it's available, the transcript is available in three languages, etc., and so, um, we did this interview, and this interview is, uh, it's really interesting. It's complicated. It's uh, it's very uh, imperfect 
and the things that made me angry about this interview, I came later to cherish because they also showed me the way to find these like little stories that can mean so much more. Now, so um, as you can see here, uh, Mirveta was born in 1930. Uh, so she was born in Jakova in a small town. Uh, this this is I found during my research. I also found picture old pictures of Jacoba that were taken by this Italian lieutenant Ottorino Murari, and were never published until very recently. I think another researcher published them in either. Well, I've I'm saw I found them through a paper, but I think they're also a book. And um, as you can see, Jacoba was was a small kind of merchant town. Um, Mirveta's family were actually, well, they were wealthy for the time, but they were also cash poor in the sense because they couldn't pay their taxes. Um, and they had land, they owned land, they managed the land, but also uh, the family were educated and they also managed the religious schools, uh, one of them at least, uh, the great grandfather. And again, this there's a whole point of pride about education uh, because my grandmother, came from a big family of eight, where there were eight children and they were all sent to school and the girls too, which was something very irregular for the time because from the census data that I found, uh, basically um, only 5% of women in 1931 in Jakova could read or write. And the the figures are even like bleaker for the rural, uh, um, the rural parts of Kosovo. Now, I mean, she completed her education in Jakova, and then she went to study in Belgrade. She became a teacher. She married my uh, grandfather, who was also a teacher. And uh, most of her life, she was work She worked as a teacher. She later worked on as an administrator, and she had three sons. And um, even then, um, even then, she always like really focused on her family. And even in the interview, she really talks a lot about this idea of staying home to take care after the family. And so in, in this essay that I wrote a couple of months ago, I focus on a few episodes uh, because I'm trying to make sense of her through of her life in Yugoslavia through, as almost as a character. And I focus a bit on the Second World War and I also focus in the immediate aftermath of the war. Uh, and I focus mostly on her youth because I really wanted to go into what she be, she was beyond what you know she means to me directly, like as a grandmother, as a mother, you know, as this family person. I really wanted. Uh, to actually understand her. Um, and yeah, it's meth like, I think methodologically it was all over the place, but this is why it's a very kind of, it's a literary piece. Um, and I mean, looking at Yugoslavia through my grandmother's experience allowed me to do a couple of things, like on a very kind of banal um, level, obviously Yugoslavia meant different things to different people. And it all, it, it really depended on their access to privilege, on their positionality. And obviously these meanings changed through time. So she was interviewed in 2000, 2014. And by that time she was very disillusioned, but that doesn't mean that she like had completely kind of uh, dis disowned uh, socialist Yugoslavia. And secondly, uh, by noting this privilege that my grandmother and her possibly, and possibly, I mean, that my grandmother had really, uh, you but you still focus on her instead of the other people in her family. I wanted to really focus on this kind of ostensibly ordinary person, because um, then you see through her sort of this like this original promise of socialist Yugoslavia, uh, how well, how it played out for like for very ordinary people and what it meant when it uh, was kind of broken. And I feel like that's what her story allows us to do. Um, and one of the key episodes that I uh, recount in the essay, and I, I'm, oh God, I'm really over time, but I'll, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, and because this also is a practical way to show you how her story kind of gives you more nuance to the historical episodes. Um, so one of the key episodes is the one that um, basically is happening during the Second World War. It's the night that the house of the family is burned down by Italian forces. And uh, this is, you know, it's really kind of an interesting story because, you know, the, the factual historical account basically would the factual historical accounts say is that in April 1943, parts of Jakova were burned down by Italian uh, forces and in retaliation of the communists trying to kill one of the Italian collaborators. Now, and then historians will interpret this act as one of the episodes that aggravated the local population and basically um, 
cre created this animosity towards the Italians or in like, or as my sister Marika, who's the actual historian was called it indiscriminate uh, violence. Now in Fadil Hoja's own memoir, we see that, um, or not really his memoir, but an interview he gave to Vazan Suroy, we learn also about the kind of the action, right? The unsuccessful attack against the collaborator, uh, Ali Bokshi. And we learn that he and three of his partisans are trying to kill Ali Bokshi and 30 bandits who were serving fascism and uh, who were basically jeopardizing the partisan bases in the Jakova Highlands. And now the four of them go to kill him. It goes awry, like there's a grenade is thrown on a on a on a roof and it actually reflects the partisans everybody learns who tried to kill him and then they run away now what what our um what my grandmother's story actually helps us then understand is exactly like uh where this account ends and where like actually the story begins for the local civilian population so uh her story gives us more human-centered perspective for example for her, it was very traumatic because um, they don't know what's happening. And it all starts with this image of a blackbird crashing on the window and which superstitiously, I think not only my grandmother, but a lot of people in Kosovo consider it as a bad omen. So basically a blackbird crashes on, on the window and then the family just hear these boom, boom, booms, which they don't know what they are. They can be a knock on the door or they can be an actual like bombs that the Italians are throwing at the, at the house. And then the family run into the neighbor's house while the parents, so my great grandparents, stay back to um, to actually talk to the Italians, and then they change their mind and leave basically this oil lamp in the middle of the yard. So we have all of these elements in the story that you're not really sure how did the house get burned out? Did the Italians burn it, or was it kind of like a mix of factors? And then the family also are trying to run away when from the other neighbor's house when that house also catches fire and the next door neighbors are also uh resistant to accepting them because they're afraid that their house too will get burned down and so they actually shove my great grandfather and he breaks his leg and so through this story we then understand kind of the plight not only of the family but also the reaction of the families around them and of the of the city and how actually they too are organize and how they behave in war. And I think that it basically adds this nuance of fear that is essentially very much lacks from these action stories where like the partisans go in, try to kill someone, they run away and we don't get to hear what happens next. And um, and also it's almost, it's almost tragicomical because once my great grandparent, according to my grandmother's story, of course, so this is also in the realm of uh, almost fiction now, um, when he breaks his legs or hurts his legs, he needs to be carried by my grandmother's sister, who we learn she's stout and big. And so there are all of these details that otherwise get unwritten out. Um, and through, so after this, they go to my, my um, so my grandmother would explain that after the house was burned down, they went to the uh, their maternal uncle, and then they were trying to find houses to live in to rent but none of the neighborhoods wanted them. And she would say, and this was like what broke us in a way, uh, because they would say, no, no, you can't come here because then they will come after us too. We'll get a target on our back. And, uh, and basically they are really purely like left on the street. They're homeless in that sense. And through this kind of stories, uh, which basically this scarred her for life, my grandmother, I think, uh, we get also like, human failure, you know, and how people saw the war and, you know, the good, there are no good guys, bad guys, simplicity here. Like even the partisans were perceived with ambiguity. And um, after the war, these kind of human losses were really glossed over um, because we, it's very easy to kind of mythologize this figure of the martyr, of the sacrifice, and, you know, rationalize these victims and these deaths and the the city being burned down. And obviously it's not just the city because I also wrote in my essay that um, they killed all of the men of the Grezda family, including a very young 11 year old boy, Ferid Grezda, who was my grandmother's age and something that I guess I forgot because Kosovo is so small, you just assume everybody knows. We're talking here about one street. Like these are all neighbors, like the 
from the collaborator who goes to kill everyone all the way to the last one. This is one small street in a very small town in Kosovo. And so this is very kind of, it has this very human, very tangible element um, impact the war, I mean, it has. And so these are the things that really get lost in historical accounts. And so, okay, I've really gone over time now. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna go into a, another anecdote, but like I wanted to show you basically how I was using these different sources and historical sources to kind of paint this larger picture that really is does not exist. Like there's no room for that. And um, I mean, I, I will end today here like with a, with a quote by uh, Svetlana Alexievich, who has been really a huge influence in the way that I perceive oral history and kind of what I try to do with this kind of work is that as she writes when uh, this is from her book, The Unwomanly Face of War, which is an oral history of women in the Second World War. Obviously, she talked mostly to uh, Soviet women, but basically she writes, I believe that in each of us, there is a small piece of history in one half a page in another two or three. Together, we write the book of time. We each call out our own truth, the nightmare of nuances. And I really love this turn of phrase, the nightmare of nuances, because really what is more soothing than a than you know, for a good night's sleep than a very neat story. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. This is this was very very uh, layered, and I think it it very vividly, effectively sort of captured the the uh, for those of you who had have had a chance to read the essay, and for those of you who haven't had a chance, um, I hope that you do. But it really sort of captured kind of the the layered quality of a lot of the sort of how uncovering one layer of memories really sort of made it challenging in, 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 in sometimes in unexpected ways into how to go back in time. And also there was a real question of sort of, you can go endlessly back in time, right? At a, in, in, and, and there's a kind of an, sort of an endlessly archeological nature to, 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 to the essay that I think also came across. And I, the, the other element that I, that, I, that I really appreciated was there's a, the, in both of the essay and the, in the presentation here today, there's, a, there's just the visual, just the work with the vision, in addition to the oral history, which uh, you, you pointed out and is so important, particularly for those of us historians who have to kind of are bound by official narratives and official sources and state produced historical sources. It's so important to have this additional source base, but there's a kind of very powerful visual uh, work that you did with visual sources, right? So I just wanted to just ask, just, just ask you very, very briefly about that um, and, and sort of, did you did you first uh, obviously this this was narratives that were familiar to you your grandmother her family her her past fadil but did did you go first through through the visual stuff did you did you go did you or how 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 did that process look like mm -hmm. yeah no actually i didn't and i we were we actually first approached this we didn't we weren't thinking initially to do visuals archival material came across later. Some of the photographs that were used in the essay, really, let me just find that I really wanted to share with you. because It's one of my kind of favorite, although it's, um, I think it's at the end. So like, for example, like this, I didn't really have a clue that this existed. So this is my grandmother in early, like late 40s, early 50s. And obviously she does, she does not, is not playing this but it's kind of a post and it some of the pictures I knew existed but I when I was writing I didn't go through the archives and I was purposefully trying not to describe the pictures and I was trying to dilute my own kind of memory of that but and we were thinking actually to go for paraphernalia that we had around the house uh, a socialist period initially Ferdi Limoni the photographer who worked on this so it wasn't actually it was kind of at the same time I'm I'm horrible when I work because I essentially I can do one thing at a time. So I was this writing this essay a month and it was just in my head all the time. And I was trying not to be diluted. But then I realized that much other visual material kind of complemented it very well, actually worked even better than we initially assumed. So it was kind of two separate researches in a way. Um, and then the of Jakova is sort of completely different because I didn't want to use something like that. All I had them because just it wasn't going well with the family kind of the family archives stuff as well but yes so most of the stuff here visually that I that you're seeing separately after the, it was actually finished so 
it was not like a point endeavor, but it's very difficult, obviously, because as you say, I already knew the story. I, I knew of some of the visuals for sure. And there's a, the, the, the other, so I, I love this picture. I love the a whole bunch of them, but there were, there, 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 there seemed to be an, a theme both in the essay and, and it also came, came across in your, in your presentation that the, the, the issue of education sort of being at the core of both some of these standard narratives about sort of families that prize education, that care about education. But I think you, you brought out sort of the stakes of it, right? Because we're talking about very, very high levels of illiteracy that obviously there's a reason for why obey, uh, the, the, well into the post-war period, I mean, certainly in the interwar period, we're talking about very high levels of illiteracy among Albanian speaking, uh, Albanian population. But the, the, so the, the, the theme of education um, sort of, and also kind of a generational story of, of, how, of going to university, experiencing, mm -hmm. experiencing that as both physical mobility, but also kind of a, you know, with, with a certain sentiment of a certain idea of progress, of social progress. So that I was also intrigued by that and, and kind of how, in a sense, that, th that is a theme that runs through a lot of uh, Albanian um, uh, uh, narratives, standard narratives mm -hmm. uh, about the importance of, of that. Um, but I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you handle that, because on the one hand, it sort of goes along certain nationalist and national oriented uh, uh, um, frameworks. On the other hand, it is subversive because within the Yugoslav context, clearly this was seen, the ability to, 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 to pursue education and the ability, right? And then we associate the early 1980s demonstrations, we of course associate them with students and we associate them with, with an educational context. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about sort of how, how, how you navigated that. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, as if one watches or reads the interview that my grandmother gave you the sense that she wants to improve, you know, an educated family. And this is very tied to status, like families are educated, et cetera. And absolutely, there's this, um, there's that line, uh, which is very problematic in a way to create this kind of generational uh, cohesiveness. And as if like, this is sort of the, um, like inheritance that we have, right? Like if certain things have like a craft that being intellectuals is our sort of legacy, right? And I really wanted to kind of turn that uh, over on its head. And this is why I mentioned in the article that it's a function of privilege because we're talking about very privileged people who had the means to educate their children. I'm not talking only about the generation of my grandmother, but I'm also talking about the generation before that because her great grandfather, um, her uh, grandfather, not some my great, oh God, too many grandfathers. <laughs> uh, her grandfather is uh, both a, he's a religious leader, but also an man who, uh, who is based, who basically runs kind of, uh, this higher level uh, so that's like the high school of the religious schools and so my problem was exactly with this that my mother would see this as a continuum like this was something inherent in our you know kind of the genetic pool of the family when it's actually just very wealthy families having the means to send their kids the same is um the same thing was when she mentioned for example she went to school in serbian and this kind of like i intervened in the text against what she's which is and she says oh, you know but like who asked what language you could go then everybody the important thing was to go to school and I was like well no actually this is not true because most Jakova people didn't go to Serbia and this is exactly why most people were illiterate because um, even the schools that were opened by the Yugoslav kingdom and technically big schools and obviously they're free uh, were not accessible to most people and uh, and we're not even getting into the kind of the uh, economic background which is how most children actually were working, like most teenagers worked back then. They were, you know, shaga. I, I don't know who you would call them in English. I can't really think of the term, but like intern today, year old intern learning a craft. Um, so this is exactly what I was trying to question because it really, it, how much of this like we uh, use and we probably are like these very traditional geographies that, oh, we finished the school there and then. You know, it's like it's something as if it was purely an achievement of theirs, actually very much a telltale sign of their privilege. Yeah, thank you. Um, just, so just, I, 
I have so many questions. Sorry, I'm probably throwing questions your way, but it's it's mm -hmm. all so rich, and there's multiple multiple entry points um, into into the story. So you mentioned in your presentation that um, you you talked to your sister, uh, the historian Rika Limani, whose work I also recommend and whose work also I have assigned uh, this semester on, on sort of the student, uh, the generation of the student protesters in Kosovo, and she sort of uh, was a little bit hesitant to have you go the route that you decided to go, which was sort of the more, more, more introspective and personal uh, yeah. approach to this. And the and so I wanted to ask a little bit about, okay, so that what was the reception uh, yeah. of the piece? And kind of how did you, did it, did it sort of deliver on, on some of those concerns? Did it, or, or did you, how, how did that play out? And what, what how, how did you handle that? Yeah, I mean, yes and no, in the sense of the piece was very well received, I think, overall. I think a lot of people that normally don't really read 2.0, which is very much, uh, it's a magazine that started out as a kind of magazine and is, has a very kind of, like this cosmopolitan youth from Kosovo and people who are interested in but are kind of like, understand uh, and maybe like passive leaning. Um, so no, like, I feel like it reached an audience that was more than their typical audience and it had a really uh it was very well received by and say older people <laughs> um but yes there were absolutely people who thought that i was doing exactly what i intended not to do which was kind of cue this history of like heroes and traitors i really wanted to go beyond that it really didn't interest me it doesn't interest me to uphold um certain historical figures and i think triggered a lot of well some were triggered by the term you're going to stop which is uh a, well basically it's a curse um if you put it on someone essentially uh, i mean and i i wanted to kind of deal with that head-on in the text like because the worst thing that can someone can do you if you're dealing with the yugoslavia and are trying to kind of talk about the sides as well is basically you're going nostalgic and that uh you are basically a traitor they just want i don't know and a version of serbia back. i'm really now i'm completely generalizing but um but basically i think i wanted to deal with that head-on in text and i did because i don't think nostalgia overall and you go nostalgia is that simple of course that there are certain generations that will have it and of course i have it second hand because I'm, to, I'm trying to kind of mourn my very much love grandmother so you know she lived in the period and this is you know like and this is exactly why as you said like the story is rich because it's complicated you cannot reduce people to one thing and especially not just one period, despite of having you know the meaning of it having changed the reception was i think to that extent mixed there was a lot of positive feedback um and then there was some negative feedback as well people thought it was exactly you nostalgia and also that it to paint this picture of uh you know this super grandmother and that i was actually trying to absolve uh Fadil Hoja, these figures who were one way or another were enmeshed in the persecution of albanians and i honestly i can say that it's a fair reading i mean yes i like the problem the big problem uh i guess the biggest thing i just problem with the text is it is in a way, yes, it's a memory grandmother. So of course it does that. It, it's absolutely, it is true. Um, I mean, I am also in that sense that I'm a writer and I have form to write about my grandmother, whereas other people not have it. So in the sense, I think that is absolutely, you know, a kind of fair, uh, legit argument. And so I see it on both sides, but I also, don't think that's an unhealthy thing. I think it's very healthy for people to understand that certain periods, not just certain periods, but like we need to talk about this period because we do work in Yugoslavia, regardless of how violent it was to us. And that's just, you know, how it is. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's particularly, you, you mentioned early on, sort of in the first half of the presentation about how there, there's a certain ten, so, and, and I've encountered this over the years and years of teaching and, and talking to students and advisees, but there's a sense in which kind of the absences, whether they're intentional at certain points during a, a regime that sort of excluded certain groups of people, 
and then whether they're unintentional because absences over time become structural, right? And so we don't find voices of Albanians in, in stories of Yugoslavia. And you mentioned how you can sort of do entire volumes or even inter, entire exhibits on Yugoslavia and have, have Yugoslavia be sort of this force for non-alignment, solidarity, and so, but then there's such absences that over time become kind of myths, right? And so you, and, and people, and so I think in, seen from that perspective, this, is, this could be also seen as an open-ended invitation actually to do, and through the oral history initiative, that's a, very, a great, great example, but it's, it's a kind of just to, to sort of bring in and to make these stories much more central to, the, uh, to, to how we think about. Um, so there's a number of questions I wanna, I wanna turn to, the, to our Q&A um, uh, chat box and invite uh, all of you, if you have comments or questions uh, to, to you f- feel free, welcome to uh, sh- share them with us. So we have, we have a comment from Thea, um, just uh, thanking you for the, for the insightful presentation. And then Sashenka uh, asks a number of questions. Um, the, the, particularly on this period of sort of the nineties when, when mm-hmm. um, uh, the, the, there, so there's a question here about to, to the extent to which the memory of Yugoslavia change or evolve for, for, for the Albanians uh, in Kosovo that sort of how they thought of it um, uh, in terms of its viability. Um, I always wondered about those that were collectively hurt the most by the break of Yugoslavia and how they could square the fundamental values and ideologies with what happened in the 1990s or in the 80s, a little bit earlier already. Um, talking to your grandmother in 2014, uh, how were those episodes coherently placed together um, uh, in, 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 within the framework of sort of personal memory? Mm. I think, honestly, um, I mean, my first reading of the interview once we've done it, once we did it in 2014, was that uh, my grandmother was very old and like uh, it was kind of this fragmented interview because of that. But honestly, I think it wasn't just that. I think there is no coherence to what happened to the people who were kind of and I wouldn't say that they were impacted the most by the fall, like the breakup of Yugoslavia or the collapse of um, the collapse of the socialist uh, state. It's just that um, it's their values, I think, were kind of first changed through time. And particularly, I think they were really disillusioned in the 1980s. And this is when Yugoslavia was still very much Yugoslavia. And, and this is the difference between perhaps the Kosovo Albanian experience and the Bosnian experience, is that the 80s were uh, so brutal in a way, and were so disillusioning for everyone, because the Serbian, uh, the Serbian Communist Party and the regime did not just go after the Albanian nationalists. It went after the original partisans. It went after the people who were very much invested in the socialist structure, and then it broke down the ties into very like this ethnic line, which made it then easier to cohere and to like to create this cohesive national Albanian identity of struggling against the Serbs, which is why we're, we usually don't really deal with socialism um, or like the, we don't see ourselves as a post-socialist or post-communist society as much as, you know, one that's a post-conflict society. Because for us in the eighties, the conflict became really ethnic in the eighties instead of like one would say of like ideological, right? And then of course it immediately was given even more attention to the arrest. They happened throughout the socialist period. So it's not that Albanians forgot. It was just, they were not part of the official narrative, right? They were always minimized. They were always kind of like hushed, hushed. And I think this is, you can sense this in the interview. For example, how my grandmother dealt with this is that she would, for example, highlight inter-ethnic conflict even at work that she had, like when um, when Serbian mothers would accuse her that she's only accepting Albanian children in her kindergartens, which is a very random story she mentions, but it's you know it's something that now occurs to her in 2014 because these like inter-ethnic conflicts are what are in the forefront of her experience. So I think this is the lens with which she looks at it, and it's not coherent and. Definitely, like I think, especially because she was um, retired and uh, she had a tiny pension, which is something I really notice a lot, even in Alexievich's books, like when she talks to people who are old and, you know, have tiny pensions, they, of course, have this sort of longing for the Soviet or Yugoslav stability, like the social welfare. And I think this too kind of gave her this view. So 
she, my grandmother, was trying to kind of maintain all of these very conflicting and um, contradictory values still, even late in her life. And I mean, I think that's kind of inevitable. And it's just like, we're not like, even as humans, we don't necessarily kind of square. We're like, we're, we don't have a definite like closure with our own kind of political um, turmoils, so to speak. But yes, absolutely. Like, yes, she was like, it's really weird. You in the interview, she like, for example, would use the uh, the pejorative term for Serbs. It's really, it's really strange. You know, it's something that I really sincerely doubt she would have ever used before. Thank you. Um, uh, the, there's there's another question I think Hannah's that also it, it relates to, um, to 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 this uh, theme of sort of what one what one makes of. Uh, a, a very mixed uh, sense of, of identifications. Um, she, uh, so she thank, uh, thanks you for brilliantly capturing the inheritance of so many Albanian families in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, we are bound to those who believe in the Yugoslav promise of equality and those against uh, the partisan Yugoslav idea. What are 80s and 90s kids meant to do with these conflicting allegiances and how um, we connect our experience of Albanianness today to these to these legacies. Yeah, I mean, I think what we understand as Albanianness today does partially come from a very uh, particular experience of the um, of the of last century, and so for, and this is also the reason why there is different ways of being Albanian today, uh, and. Uh, and not only like in terms of Albania and Kosovo, definitely there's a plurality of different uh, of different identities uh, that Albanians can kind of inhabit. Um, so, but I think we need to recognize that there is a cultural history and a there is a social history that needs to be prodded to understand what experiences we had in the 20th century. And it's not that far, time, like far, like it's not that far back into the past, you know, and we always, and the more that we understand that this kind of, these experiences are not just keys, but also enrich our cultural diversity um, as Albanians, we will, I think, understand a bit better uh, to go beyond this very kind of reductive idea of national identity. And there's not a single, you know, single way of being. What it means for us, I think is just generally very kind of on a very, it's very personal. It will be connected to our personal family histories as well. If we understand our parents and what they've done. I think uh, for me, it was very interesting because I said, um, I live with my grandmother, but for example, my father who also passed away a few years ago, he was, you know, he was, an absolute hippie and he hated uh communism you know so it was really interesting to see how like they made sense of their own parents generation and how and i don't believe like i'm i'm not a hegelian to believe in dialectics so uh it's just like we need to kind of dig into these to understand basically our kind of contemporary identity understand our parents and kind of intergenerational communication that often breaks down because of our kind of misunderstandings of those periods. But I don't think we need to carry it as a burden, essentially. This is the one thing that I would kind of hope that we all move on from this, is that this is not certain, like, of course, we carry it as a memory and this affects us, but it's not something that we should see as a burden. Um, we were raised with our own traumas, especially if we, for the people who were born in the early 80s and who have experiences of kind of the war in Yugoslavia. So I feel like we cannot resolve those issues for them, but we really need to kind of learn about them and learn through them, learn to understand our kind of the previous generations and how that makes us what kind of Albanians we are today. This, um, what, what you just said, sort of, I have like a quick reaction to it because from the from the perspective of, of someone who, you know, grew up in, in communist Albania, but also kind of works on it and tries to tries to uh, figure out how how to approach a status authoritarian, you know, dictatorship that kind of nationalized a lot of history and, and kind of put it on on a very specific sort of trajectory. Mm -hmm. And 
there is, I, I sense a lot of times in public discussions uh, in, in Albania or with Albanian, because as you mentioned, Albanian is pluralistic and diasporic now. So you can engage yeah. in Albanian language across national borders and that's just a reality. Um, uh, but I sense a, a lot of times that there's a, there's a sort of a, a, a kind of expectation for certain narratives about the past to speak to everyone or, or, to, or, or, or not to everyone, but to sort of to capture a totality Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't, I, I never know what to, what to make with that. On the one level, I sort of understand it because it's it, the, the, the way history has been thought of under status sort of realities has been in this sort of totalizing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, a lot of times I sort of, I try to bring in micro history. I try to bring in the personal history, biography. Obviously your approach here is, is valuable in that, in that regard. But it, it, do, do you sort of see similar dynamics of basically uh, sort of uh, expectation that that historical writing needs to be kind of capturing um, uh, sort of the totality of experiences? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And I mean, the biggest, I think the biggest, oh, I don't know if it's an, a problem or an obstacle, but it's an obstacle to good writing is that it has to mean to everyone everything. And it's just impossible, you know, it's impossible to represent everything in its totality. And I think this is why I also end my essay so abruptly, because in able to do so, like you'd have to create an entire world anew to be able to represent everyone the way that they can see and identify themselves fully. And that's really impossible, you know, as writers, particularly, I mean, historians have obviously a different kind of you have a different burden to carry because you are supposed to be writing the truth. Whereas as writers, we can play with it, right? Uh, I don't. I mean, I saw that this is definitely something that people feel, and this is not only for historical writing. This is for everything, for every account. Like the biggest comment that people usually give, uh, either like in a discussion or in when you're writing an article, is like, "But you didn't mention this." But okay, but like I didn't. But this is just an article. It's a finite number of words, and it's a finite space and it's impossible to represent everyone and I think honestly the other thing is that it's impossible that I personally can represent everyone and I understand everyone or I can talk in everyone's the way that everyone would kind of identify with it and when I say everyone I don't mean everyone in the world but even like for an Albanian experience and I absolutely I have to like and I'm I'm aware and I, I hope that it comes through when I write that I'm completely I'm kind of I'm making a note a self-reflective note of where I'm writing and what I'm doing, because I obviously, I don't necessarily always represent just myself and I don't believe that that's the only way to do so, but there are certain things that hinder me from seeing things in different ways. And if those are pointed out to me, that's great, but that doesn't mean that there is a responsibility for me to be able to do everything at once, you know? And I mean, in history, this is a different matter because as I said like history needs to be more aware of its own limitations, whereas I think writers are inherently kind of aware and play with it and kind of notice it and note it. Um, but with historians too, like I think is it's really impossible and I hope that history doesn't really develop that way. Like we have this idea that you're building up this narrative and this discourse and like after Elidar, there will be another professor at CUNY who will continue his great work and will not reinterpret your work. And that I think is just very limiting, even for historians. Like, I hope that someone will look at these pieces and kind of, you know, uh, reinterpret them and give them a different reading entirely. And this is something that we need to kind of learn, I think, especially from uh, post-colonial interventions. And this is not something that's really done a lot in our academia locally, nationally, and I mean, in our language generally. So yeah, I mean, I'm rambling, but honestly, like it's impossible to, to be everywhere at once. <laughs> Uh, just could you just add a little bit so obviously the, the this is sort of a generalized very very yeah. general question but uh, since based on the, the the comments that you just made um, what as someone who is active has been writing has been publishing and has 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 a uh, media presence and a public presence uh, in for 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 a number of years now um, do, what is sort of the generational story in, in, in Kosovo in terms of the approach. Now, whether it's the, the sort of the distant past or the more recent past, um, obviously uh, you, you provided the, the historical background, there's the, the political background, there's, um, we can talk about sort of socioeconomic background, but 
in the sense of where the stakes are for kind of the younger generation in Kosovo uh, today um, or their outlook on, on where Kosovo sort of belongs. Um, very, very broad question, but even just from, from, from within your particular perspective as someone who's, who's been sort of active and has kind of perspectives on civil society, on organizations, on media, on, um, um, what do you see as the main challenges? Mm. I, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge right now is this kind of our isolation because we see, um, I, I fear that my generation, which was kind of raised in the 90s and were like still young after the war, we had more kind of cultural exchanges with Serbs and other nationalities than the younger generation that is now like going to school or is are like going to university have. And their understanding of history is, and of what is happening in Kosovo is just like of deep injustice. And this is gonna be their story there. It's unjust and unfair that Kosovars cannot travel anywhere. It's unjust and unfair that we have an unresolved relationship with Serbia and kind of this, especially now with the war in Ukraine, like threatens this, you know, there's a sense of doom and potential war in the Balkans. So they're kind of, they are growing up and into that. And so I think this is really for them, it's kind of almost abstract talking about dealing with the past or especially thinking about the socialist period, because these are issues really far away from for them and not necessarily informative. I think our parents' generation, perhaps, like, so I'm talking about people who are in their 60s, 70s, um, have more of a sense of, like, have this kind of, they want this continuation between the social welfare that they had in Yugoslavia and expect now, even though they live in a very neoliberal uh, country, um, economy, I mean, not country, uh, but with the young people, like, they don't even have that kind of uh, sense of continuity. And it's just that uh, basically this isolation and uh, underdevelopment because of both economic and political situation in the Balkans really informs a sense of kind of unfairness towards them. And I don't know what that will create, but I hope it will not create, you know, kind of this reactionary identity formation that becomes like purely a nationalist force. But that is obviously something that I'm completely, you know, this is generalization on my part because it's not that there's something to base off. I know a few years ago, there was a survey done with like younger kids, like 18 and, and, or so. And it's, it was really surprising. Like the younger kids were less optimistic about reconciliation with Serbia than the older generation because they had an experience where they lived and worked with Serbs. And, you know, there was a different kind of narrative that for them, it was both worlds were still possible. And for this generation of people who are post-war, who have not experienced, um, who have not experienced or have like had that much of a contact with uh, the neighboring countries and countrymen, uh, it's really strange. I mean, they encounter each other online and it's mostly hate. And so this is why it's really, it's actually, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of comes out of that, of this kind of both isolation and sense of doom. And I don't think this is partially, like this is not only one-sided. I feel like, I fear that in Serbia too, probably the same kind of mood is very much alive. And it's quite concerning, I'd say, because um, yeah, like there's a lot of optimism that was after the war uh, that just is not there right now. Thank you very much. Uh, this was so uh, just, if you have any final questions, uh, uh, feel free to share them. Otherwise I will um, thank you all for participating uh, for, I would like to first and foremost to thank Lura for just absolutely fascinating and very, very rich uh, presentation uh, that combined the personal, the, 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 the writers, uh, relationship with, 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 with his audience and also kind of absent histories and neglected histories, and neglected histories uh, in Yugoslavia and the way we think about it and some of the challenges and some of the stakes in kind of doing this work. This was very interesting, uh, very appreciated. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, keep an eye out on future events. Uh, I wish you all a, a great week. Thank you, Gura, for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lidar. Have a good day. Take care.